words, I just explained, uh, the chairman asked, he was dealing with a, a family emergency tonight, and uh, uh, Vice Chair Noble is on her way, she's calling traffic right now, so we'll go ahead and get started, um, maybe go through reports, and uh, then we can, we can wait until Sylvia's here before we take any action on any action items, but just kind of be respectful of everybody's time so we can move forward. So. I'm going to read this. Any person present who wishes to address the board or raise any questions about public school district matters or governing policies may do so under public participation. No discussion of personnel or individual students is permitted at this time. A limit of three minutes is placed on each speaker. Persons who want more time may make arrangements to be placed on a future agenda. As a courtesy, all cell phones should be turned off. The public is also reminded that they may provide input on all motions being considered by the board at this meeting. Uh, so I don't know if there was any public comment turned into you all this said. No. Uh, we did have somebody submit some public comment via the uh, online forum. Uh, Craig Stockman of 829 Rochester just basically his real short comment and just said a lot of recent tragedy in Texas. I think we need to address our security measures. One school resource officer cannot cover the entire campus efficiently. Secondly, I've never been asked to state my business or show ID when being buzzed into a building. That should, cha that should change whether they know me or not. Um, uh, as far as SRO, uh, you know, the, I don't know that the county, we're pretty blessed to have one SRO right now at this point. Uh, I know they're very short-handed, but uh, we would certainly work with the county um, we'll later on we'll be addressing the cost of the SRO for next year. Um, I've got some ideas, some creative ideas possibly to offset some of those costs and maybe expand school security in terms of that locally. Um, and as far as stating the business or showing ID when being buzzed in the building, that is our protocol. That should be being done every time somebody comes. So if that's not happening, we need to have a conversation with whoever's running those buzzers. Is he wanting it when they like to show it at the camera before they come in or when they come in the office they have to get the, the pass. Yeah, to get a visitor's pass you have to scan your ID. I don't, I don't know, Craig, and I'm not sure what building he has children in or any of that type of stuff. Primary. Primary. My dad is getting my Rhonda without scanning in. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> she doesn't play, so. Even at the middle school when I sign my son out, <clears throat> she scans my, I have to put my, yeah. my driver's license in all the thing on her. Yeah. I'm thinking he's probably thinking when he buys, they just got the door open, not, yeah. not that part, so. Start asking who he is. Yeah. And I do know in some schools that they, they make you answer before they buzz you in, that you have, they have to talk back and forth of what your reasoning, why you're there. But it's very tough to hear through some of those systems, yeah. you know, communicate back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. We've remodeled all of our offices so that when you have access to the office, you don't have access to the general building until they have the ability to scan your ID and those type of things. So, I mean, I think I don't, we can certainly take another look at it. Uh, that's one of the goals uh, next year. Uh, that's uh, our community welfare specialist, Tana, who's a former law enforcement officer, to focus a little bit more on protocols and those type of things in the elementary. We also talked today uh, about, uh, in the past, we had monthly meetings with our secretaries to make sure everything's consistent between the buildings, and we're going to start those up again here. Uh, just so that there's consistency with that as far as things like doctor's notes and those kind of things as well. Too, so. Any other so with that, we'll actually go into uh, reports. Mark, you want to talk about it? facilities reports, and do you want to address the boilers as well while you're doing this? Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> so this, in May, we had uh, two boilers fail, um, and then in February we had one fail. So we've had three boilers fail over the last few months. Um, the plan, original plan was to do one every year over the course of the next five years to replace all our boilers because they were installed 2008, and life expectancy is 20 years, but um, the boilers we got back in 2008, we've, we've been babying them. They're just they're not quality products. 
So anyway, we're going to have to do two boilers this summer so that I feel comfortable we won't lose a building this winter and have to shut it down, drain the water, and try to keep it from freezing. And then as far as the report, are there any questions? Those boilers are about $75,000 each? Yes. So that will be coming out of the building reserve. Um, you know, it's always something we have planned on doing it just to I'm sorry, time frame yes. for the second one. And that's, uh, we'll pay for the boiler separate and then have the, them installed separately. Yes. How much is the installation on that? Um, I would have to double check my numbers, but I think it was, because they have to do some repiping because the new boilers aren't going to match up with what we have currently. So, but I think it was in the neighborhood of, for each boiler? What's that boiler? Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's that boiler? Uh, hot water boiler? Water wall? Uh, fire tube? You also said it's about two months out on getting them? Yes, they're, they're two months out from when we place the order to look. We'll actually see it. Have we placed the order yet? We have not. Okay. And tell me, what fund did you say it's coming out of? Building reserve. Building reserve. Do, do we maintain those ourselves? Do you have a boiler technician on staff? Yes, I'm the licensed boiler operator. Second. Was there any luck on getting any of those positions that we're looking back for? Just full of good news, aren't you? <laughs> That's why I went first. <laughs> Any other questions for Mark? All right, thank you. I'll just highlight a few things out of my report. Uh, if you look at the attendance, the enrollment, uh, um, we were up from the same time last year, the end of last year, we were up, you know, we tend to lose enrollment the last couple months, the last month two of the school year. A lot of times families will move and they won't enroll kids until the following school year. If just, you know, coming in for a week or two is usually not great. And then obviously we had some expulsions that affected that a little bit. But uh, from last year to this year, we were up 205 students, 204 students district wide. So if you figure, you know, one additional grade, I think our kindergarten is a pretty small one. Uh, where we got kindergarten about 110, Jenny, is that this year? You know, so even despite the additional grade level with the, adding the juniors from last year, uh, or, you know, adding the junior class that we that we didn't have last year, we're still up about an additional 100 students district-wide. So beyond what that extra, one extra grade is. Um, Last week we had a very busy week on campus. Uh, we were hosting the Building Bridges training with Dr. Alcott. Uh, we also had uh, the parent listening session on Tuesday night and then the work session with the board on Wednesday. And then we had a uh, uh, administrative training in this room on yesterday uh, with uh, schools from all over the area. St. Lavray had several people here. Building Central had several people here. Zorky, a lot of the schools in the area. Um, we learned a lot uh, in listening to the parents on their concerns with Mastery Connect and the standards-based reporting. I think we've uh, clarified why we're moving forward with this. We've kind of clarified our plans as far as training for staff. We did meet with Marie based on the feedback from the school board about trying to have some mandatory trainings during the school year where teachers that haven't volunteered and gotten the training done during the summertime would uh, we put subs in their classroom and do the training here on campus while she's here. LeBray's bringing her in for some training as well too so we can piggyback with them to split some of the, tra the travel costs and those type of things. So we're going to kind of double down and make sure that people are, uh, are know that this is uh, uh, something that we believe in and something we're going to be moving forward with and uh, it will be required and not optional moving forward. Um, with resources, uh, 
coming out of the COVID, the FCC has what they're calling emergency connectivity funds. You've seen several of these come through. Uh, Telephone's done a great job of applying for these, and we just got awarded recently another $150,000 that will be going towards Chromebooks, getting devices in the hands of students. Um, so we did great work with that, Darlene. Um, appreciate that. Um, a little bit later, we're going to talk about the uh, alternative date for the regular July meeting. Um, I will be in D.C. for the ASA Advocacy Conference. Uh, we go and meet with our senators, our representatives during that time. And uh, there's also governing boards and executive committee meetings while I'm there. Um, well, Mr. Klaus and I are still trying to work through Mr. Pursuit, Senator Gaines's office to get a chance to sit down and do a conference call with him, talking about uh, the school meals waiver and just how that's going to impact kids and families and, and even Montana farmers if that waiver just goes away and what the benefits of extending that would be. Uh, Senator Gaines would be a key vote if we could get him on that. Is that up this year? It's June 30th. It's done. So right now, if they don't take action on it, it goes away and we go back to full pay for the meals. And there'll be a lot of work and transition for schools because families have gotten used to having that free. And so we don't have very good, I mean, Lisa does all the free and reduced applications and we're probably at a third least. of what we normally have. So just getting parents to go through that paperwork process. Um, one of the fears right now is with the supply chain issues that we're facing and you know, all the things, even now with flooding and stuff, districts are having a hard time getting reimbursable meals because you have to get certain, you know, like, uh, you know, yeah, everything has to be whole bread and those type of things. And a lot of those things are really difficult right now, and so schools are really worried that we're going to go back to uh, charging for meals, and we won't be able to get the federal reimbursement for it because that was part of the waiver if it doesn't meet the, the exact standards. So there's, there's a lot of things up in the air on that. Um, you know, it's also being an agriculture state in Montana, we disproportionately benefit. You know, there's a, it's a USDA program, so if USDA is purchasing all that, all those products, you know, that, that's a pretty much a guaranteed sales for Montana farmers and ranchers with all the different variables going on right now, like I said, supply chain and droughts and floods and everything. <coughs> so, uh, just want to touch base on the patron day. Uh, feedback I've received is real positive. Obviously, we want to shorten things up a little bit. In the future, we probably won't tour the clinic for obvious reasons. That was something we wanted to do this year. But if you have any other feedback or anything else that we should highlight during that patron day, you know, uh, please give us feedback on that. I know I've got a long list already of things that we'll do a little bit different next year. Um, but the feedback I got from the folks that were here for it was all real positive and, and uh, educational for them. A uh, couple things uh, Mr. Erickson did put in, and we were awarded the State A Softball Tournament in the spring of 2024, so not next year, but the following year. We will be partnering with Huntley Project. They'll be hosting the Class B State, state Championship, so we'll do that out at uh, Stewart Park. And uh, we'll, we'll run the Class A and we'll run the Class B together, so that should be a pretty fun event. should be a good money maker for us. Um, and then this coming weekend, we are partnering with the Midland Roundtable, so they'll have the uh, All-Star Boys Basketball game, All-Star Girls Basketball game, and the first ever All-Star Volleyball match will be in our gym this weekend. And then as a fundraiser to go along with that, Mr. Erickson and the coaches are putting on a three-on-three -three tournament. And so we'll raise funds through the three-on-three -three tournament. And then any kids or teams that play in the three-on-three -three tournament will get into the middle round table games for, for free. So kind of a, a way to you know, help them boost their attendance, but also help us raise some funds to can get some people here on campus. Um, and then the last thing I have on there is we have one more uh, designation retirement, and that's Mark Clayton. Uh, Barb's been a para here for oh, probably close to 20 years, I would guess. And uh, Barb's been phenomenal. She's, uh, you know, when I think of Barb, the first thing I think of is a smiling face and, you know, handing out candy and high fives to kids as they go across the the crosswalks and those type of things. So obviously we will, we will miss Barb, but uh, we wish her well in her retirement for obvious reasons as well. So, any questions from anyone on anything on my report? I have a question. Where's those funds going on that three and three tournament? 
that he's putting on? It goes into activities. The activities funds? It goes into activities. So we have activities, raises their own funds separate from what the, the board assigns there for, for uh, budget-wise okay. to help pay for uh, coaching shirts, warm-ups, you know, some of the travel, some of those type of things. So it's, it's a way for the teams to fundraise for what their needs are. And the team that they're fundraising for is just the basketball, the high school? No, basketball. everything. Oh, all right. activities. So okay. you'll see the board's basketball coaches out there, the volleyball, softball, all the different coaches will be out there helping out with the tournament. Oh, okay. So, so are we planning on some sessions or anything for the Class A? Yeah, for the, uh, for the all star games, a lot of concessions and we'll say the things. I don't, do you know which group's working concessions this weekend for the football? Okay. Football, football is football working concessions. So, do a travel volleyball. I drop 50 bucks a tournament on food for my daughter. Yeah, yeah, get that yeah. popcorn long and they want it. I can't do that. Absolutely. It's just all three sort of things. Yeah, I went to a few concessions. So, I did not. Inform Mr. Goyette, who's new this year, that the that, that principals don't have to do our reports in the month of June. But uh, he did such a good job, I want to make sure I present it to you guys. So, uh, if, you, if you have any questions about it, I'd be willing to uh, answer any questions you might have. So, as you can see, all the principals in the back laughing. <laughs> you guys, I, felt, I felt bad last week. <laughs> yes. So we did have quite a few things going on at the end of the year. And it's a great report. It's great to have it. Yeah. So good to see our kids being involved and doing things and a lot of great things going on. So. I have a question about the awards assembly. Why mm -hmm. was the um, why wasn't all the eighth grade parents invited? Um, I, I can't speak to to that. I know our eighth grade team. Um, they reached out and invited parents of uh, the kids that were receiving the, the main awards and so forth. They kind of set all of that up and okay. I just kind of went with it. Okay. Um, but I do think that moving forward, it, when I even said that to them, so I think this is something we probably moving forward should invite all of the great parents to. Yeah. If we continue to do it in that capacity. Yeah. Um, you know, I was, um, after talking with the other great parents and so forth, considering maybe doing a whole school awards assembly similar to that um, so we can celebrate all of our kids. So, gotcha. Yeah. No, I guess that would have been the only few. Like, it was kind of nice to see that video at the end and it was really cool. Yeah. So I would just, yeah. Absolutely. I agree. I never haven't been through it before. I, I, didn't, I didn't have any I uh, idea of what it was going to look like either and so yeah, we kind of ran it. It was good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you know who has that video? Mr. Biss. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't know. I know the kids did it though. Oh. It was very cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions from Square? Ms. Poole, are you prepared to present the Age Web Scores? Oh, well, that's a shocker. I was like, Ray, the Roar Academy, you bet your woman on. Here we go. Seriously, thank you, Tobin. Appreciate that. Yep, I'm going to get a little closer to my eyes or not. Have you had a chance? I trust that you did look through this. I hope you did. There's a lot to celebrate there. I'm um, pretty excited. I'm going to go up to this one, Tobin. There's no hope I'll see that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Do you want to kind of touch a little bit on the tiers too, and which yeah. tiers are good and which ones are yes. trying to reduce? So our goal is, you know, we have the three tiers. It is a, a mechanism that helps us understand our student body better. Um, tier one is our students that are performing pretty much on grade level. And of course, this would be a continuum difference in here if it quits Whitman. Thank you. This is a continuum within tier one, and we would say that they're mostly on grade level. They're receiving our basic um, instruction during the classrooms. We're not doing necessarily um, any specialized except for extension activities and differentiation within the classroom. Tier two is our group of students 
that is scoring in the mid-range of these, and it's showing that we have some concerns. We're not hugely concerned, um, but they are, again, not at the tier one. We have some, some flags that are going up. It helps us to deliver some more specified uh, programming, um, so maybe some changes like smaller grouping or targeted um, instruction. Tier three is a group of students that we're very concerned about. It is not, just to be very clear, it's not a group of students that are only special needs. Our special needs students can be a tier one, a tier two, or a tier three student. So I don't want you to be confused and think that we have 28% of our student population or 404 of them uh, that are special needs students. Um, so our goal is that we increase our tier one students. We increase those kids that, quite frankly, are doing well and they aren't costing us a lot. And I know that sounds kind of rough, um, what we mean by that is we're not putting more programming, we're not putting more teachers involved in, in making sure that those students um, perform at that or better. Uh, where we start having to cost us time, resources, personnel, um, specialized programming in the Tier 2 and the Tier 3. So we want to grow our Tier 1, we're trying to increase our Tier 1. We look at the other end of the shelving, uh, considering these bookends, and we look at the other end and we want to decrease that Tier 3. We don't usually set a goal for Tier 2 because what we're trying to do is understand that our students um, are going to flex between there. If we're going to move a kid from uh, into Tier 1, they might come from Tier 2, right? Because that's one step. But we also have some students that might be a Tier 3 student, and with our supports and identified uh, structures that we put in place, we might actually see them move to a Tier 1. Or we might see them move to a Tier 2. What we don't want to see is that they stay at a tier three, right? So that's our goal. Increase tier one, decrease tier three. And we've been doing this for a good number of years, long before I was here. Um, within our literacy grant, um, we started tracking how are all of our students doing. But we're also looking a little bit deeper, which will get more information, I would assume, more toward our sub at risk subgroups, more toward the fall. But this is where we're looking at all of our students in our, um, on our campus. And you'll notice that our number N uh, does change, but that is the number of students that have been assessed. So in the fall, we assessed 1,427, in the winter, 1,429, and this spring, 1,408. That does not mean that equals our enrollment. That means the number of students that we have assessed. They could have been absent when we did um, the assessment, and maybe we weren't able to capture their makeups. Does that make sense? Okay, so our goal is increase tier one, decrease tier three. Let's just take a quick peek over from the fall to the spring. Okay, what did we achieve this year? Uh, in tier one, we had 51% or 734 students across our uh, campus scoring in tier one, where we need them to be, right? There, um, and we increased that from 51. Big word, what we want to see increase, we increased it to 59%. What was the students, the individual kids in our classroom went from 734 students at Tier 1, increased to 831. And this is where you're saying, wow, that is incredible. Wow, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Huge. So now let's look at that other bookend, right? The other, we want to decrease our Tier 3. So we had 28% uh, district-wide, or 404 students scoring in Tier 3. We now have, in the spring, 305 students, or 22%. So the test question is, is did we decrease? And we did, from 28% to 22%. That's so again, Yeah, that's it, that's it, perfect. And those are our reading numbers. I yes. can pull up the math numbers as well, the similar. And you want to pay attention to the math as well, because we've been putting a big pile of efforts with the support of our literacy grant. Um, and the benefits to having, even though it's focused literacy grant, is that what we learned in one area, we can then translate and transfer to another area, and you will see some nice things starting to appear in math as well. Um, so just to quickly take you through, it's the same setup, it's the fall, the winter, the spring, it's the tier one we want to increase, the tier three we want to decrease. Fall, math, 40%, 40 I'll just round it, 40% or 566 students were tier one, and we moved that up to 49.7, we round that up to 48, that's right, I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Look at the number of kids, that's the beauty, right? Percents are percents, but look at the number of kids, individual kids, 566 up to 714. Tier three in math, 37% down to 27%. Number of students, 522, who we were very, very, very concerned about trying to do different things, trying to make sure we give them the supports, and it's down to 387. Good. 
Good job. Any questions? So, <clears throat> this is proficient versus not proficient. So we're decided that less than 50% of our students are proficient? So, no, thank you for that. that's a great question. We have some goals that set, of course we want all of our students across all of the tiers, right? The goal is this helps us get into what needs would they have. We know that when we're looking at percentiles, that we, we know through research, not necessarily what we know on campus, but ours mirrors that as well. Um, we know that our students in the tier one, within that range of tier one, um, that those students, without having much adjustment made for them, um, that we can teach our core subjects, our core um, strategies, and our core instructional practices, and that will help the student not stay where they're at, but continue to make the progress. Whereas, when we talk about these other tiers, we have to do different things for them. And so by sorting, in a crude way of saying that word sorting, because we're not trying to sort cattle, but this gives us a way to say, this group of children in general need this. This group of children in general need some, some more things in order for them to be able to stay from where they're at and progress further. So no, we're not saying this group of students, we're hoping, oh, they're about the 33rd percentile, and so we'd be super happy if they're the 35th. Short term goal, yeah, I'm super happy they're the 33rd percentile. But our goal is we want all of our students at Tier 1, but we cannot do that just by saying we want it. Right. So we'll be more prescriptive. Then you want to talk a little bit about where we set our cutoff lines as well. Yeah, so we yes. use a, a stricter cutoff line than we Yeah, we're, we're a little bit more ambitious because we know that we can achieve these things. And so what we know, um, we use a program just to give us a basic assessment called AIMSWAB, and that's where these uh, numbers come from, is our assessment that we do three times a year, and in between, check progress. So that, um, I don't want to say program, but that assessment sets some um, pretty, low, pretty low thresholds. They consider tier three to be from the first percentile to the 22nd percentile, 15th actually. They're coming down into here uh, a little bit further to give us the tier two. So what we did was we realized our students, we can be more ambitious. We, we trust our teachers, we trust our admin to be able to pull these group up strategies and these processes and these practices in place that we want to actually raise the bar because again if we just have these lower threshold these lower cuts then what we're saying is probably if you think of a big tractor wheel you know in order to get speed you better put a lot of pressure to get that big tractor wheel down the road right so we're hoping that we can put a little bit more pressure and get that wheel turning a little bit faster so we've raised our cuts it's ambitious i know our high school kind of went but we'll get there um, our, our threshold here is that we've raised it from the 15th to the 25th, and so we, we cut it higher to provide these services. Instead of cutting the Tier 3 services, more time, more direct instruction, more intensive um, practices, we instead of said that's kind of reserved for these 15th percentile kids and below, we said let's go higher with that provide those more intensive instruction and practices to provide more movement at a faster rate so that we can recoup and recover and also um, accelerate. So in our K-8, it's different for our high school, in K-8 we say first percentile to the 25th and then we say the 26th percentile to the 50th, which was at the 35th. So again, we're moving that, we're saying we can do better and we are showing we're showing that we're doing better. So we took a big risk. We took a huge risk. Um, we have a lot of principals here. We have um, former teachers sitting here that was a little anxious about us moving these cuts because the lower cuts felt better. We thought, hmm, we could probably do that. We raised the goal. Now we have to put our money where our mouth is, right? And we are doing it. In a long way, what she's saying is we've set our goals higher than just getting it to the 50th percentile. But I mean, these these are scores that we want to see improve, and, and math sure. is going to be more of a focus going forward. And part of that, what we're running out is you know with the with the reading and those type of things, we didn't see the dips that we saw in math during the pandemic. Whereas math skills are are, are more sequential, and they they scaffold on each other a lot more than what some of the reading stuff does. Okay, and I may have missed it, but it sounded to me like you said that you were putting more resources to tier three to try to get them to move up. So I guess what my concern is, is when they get to tier one, uh, how 
that we moved them along farther. Yeah, like it's, I mean, I know there's not a tier zero, but yeah. you're, you're, that's a great question because um, that can be very confusing. When I say more resources, it means that we're more targeted. It could mean more time. It could be more um, strategic planning. I might, um, as a student that's struggling, have a diagnostic assessment that says, where am I struggling? Because right now this just says, we're struggling in reading or we're struggling in math. But you have no idea, what do I have for skills, what do I lack for, for skills that I should have, right? So we might give a diagnostic assessment, and then that helps us drill and target a little bit more. Now, for our Tier 1 students, what we what we have in practice is something that our teachers do with differentiation. Where, where are the students at, and how do I move them along? Oh, you know, they have those skills, do I need to reteach teach those skills? You heard, um, maybe you heard a little bit about this uh, last week. Was it last week? Yeah, we have interventions in place for those high-level kids. So okay. Our, our focus is we're not just happy getting them to that 50 percentile. Right. We are we focus and we look at how many kids are moving into that those those top you know be the, the top 10 to 15 percent as well too. And we've got the gifted and talented program. We've got the core plus in the elementary, and we've got the the honors classes in the middle school and high school. You know? So the idea is to take them to the standards and, and far beyond. Okay. And in our elementary, we do interventions, and they're not just for kids that are struggling. All of our kids get the intervention time. So they, they do get more resources, but we're going to up the ante on um, these two tiers to make sure that we're more targeted on that piece. So, any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for that fun surprise. <laughs> and, uh, I forgot that Andrea wasn't going to be here today. She's the only one flooding her folks' place. So. So uh, trustees report, um, Pam, or Chairman Ask, asked us to um, move the MDSB meeting um, training report out to next um, next month, social report out for that. Um, I was also able to attend virtually. It was a great training, a lot of information. Um, it was fun to watch Chairman Ask on the screen the whole time. Um, uh, and so um, for 2022 is going to be uh, virtual and in person October 19th through 21. So I imagine we'll just want to let Lisa or Lori. Yeah, we just let Lori know. I just want you guys to get it on your calendars now. I know sometimes when it's in Missoula, it's hard to get a lot of folks to go. Uh, and that's part of why we're doing some of our uh, training or uh, policy updates with, with Chris is to make sure you guys are able to still get your training in. But if you want to take a look and just maybe block out those days, October 19th and 20th. Um, I won't be attending MSA this year. I'm actually going to attend the National Rural Schools Conference at that same time. Uh, it's in Green Bay, Wisconsin, so it's a, it's a pretty easy flight. And uh, um, so I'm going to try and attend that for the first time. So I just want to get that on your guys' radar. If you're interested in that, we'll get you rooms and we'll organize getting a vehicle to drive up there and those type of things. So. We'll have other administrators attending, I'm sure, as well, too. So, are we still doing four work sessions, 28 for Christmas Eve? Yes. And that is at 5 30 at the end of the for you. So, um, can we jump down to D and then jump back up to C? Since sure. Okay. So, uh, the board work session, uh, June 28th, if everyone is still okay with that. Yes. If I can still do it on Zoom. Yeah, and I have a story at 5.30. Yeah, 5.30? Yeah. Okay. And we'll bring in dinner for that as well, too. And then uh, to see the change date of our regular July meeting, um, just because of training for... Because I'm going to be in D.C. Yeah. So. Um, so if everyone's okay with it and it's a holiday weekend, so that probably makes it easier for other people, too, to do July 7th. Yeah, we want to avoid the Tuesday right after the 4th of July weekend, is, so we have it on that Thursday. Is that date work for everybody? The 7th. 7th. So we'll have our next regular board meeting on July 7th at the regular 6 p.m. time. And then the last item on there is uh, typically in July we do a, a work session for goal setting. Um, you guys take a look at this here. It's just kind of going through. Uh, you guys, if you were here at the patron day, set goals um, as far as what we do overall as a district. 
and that's kind of my marching orders for the year. Um, we also usually do a few like items that, that the board wants me to focus on during that time. It's usually a pretty long work session, you know, probably four hours, five hours. Um, we'll probably do the 5.30 start on that. So just looking at July dates that will possibly work for that. I think we're safe setting that at the next board meeting or even talking about it at the, the work session on the 28th. But if you want to start taking a look at that, with the, you know, we, we've had a couple changeovers on the board. Typically, Tuesdays always worked better for the previous board. Um, but uh, you know, just want to be make sure that that works for everybody else. So you know, we can look at the, you know, if uh, let's see the regular board meeting would be the 13th, so we can look at the 20th or the 27th or something like that. So just look at those dates, see what works for you. In, in July. In July or August. In July. In July. The regular board meeting would have been the 12th. You meant 12th? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so probably the 19th or the, the 26th then. If we want to keep it on Tuesdays, but that's up to you guys. I'm, I'm free whenever. I'm free whenever you tell me to be here. <laughs> so, and we can just get feedback on that. The next session would be okay with me. With the 19th. Does anybody have conflicts on the 19th? Works for me. I'm good. I'm in Florida. I'm waiting on approval. The 19th doesn't work 100%. Me neither. Are there any other um, planned chunks of time that we should work around, maybe, and not necessarily for a single day? What about, when are you back, Jamie? Yeah, uh, beginning of August. When do, when do you leave? We leave the 18th. We'll be gone for... I mean, I guess we could all go there. We could all just join you. I know. And I don't get back to the floor. No, I don't want to go to the floor. <laughs> no. That's a person. Uh, the first week of August. Yeah, we'll probably have to have a special budget meeting sometime in that area. Can you do it the week of the 11th to the 15th? No, that's when I'm in D.C. Do it the whole D.C. We could look at the 2nd of August. Okay. School starts when? 23rd. 3rd, I think, is August. Mm -hmm. School starts. The teachers are here on the uh, 23rd or 22nd, and uh, school starts on the 24th. Under the second week of August, is it? Do we want him to do it on August 2nd? Does that work for everybody? Is, are you you're back by then, Jamie? Or? No. Oh, you're not? Uh, I believe it's the 8th of the week. And we're in, we're in Minneapolis that week for the PLC conference. So we can work, we can talk about some dates. And okay. I'll talk with Sylvia and, and Pam and we can talk about some possible dates and then we can maybe come up with some ideas at the next work session. Does that sound good? Yes. Yeah. So Um, good to move to consent agenda. Okay. So for consent agenda, I don't have the minutes. Do I?
do believe we have some of our hires here who we need to introduce. Obviously, everybody knows Miss Wolf. We're going from Mrs. Wolf as the assistant principal in the middle school to Miss Wolf in the middle school, so that won't be confusing for, for any of our students at all. It's fine. Everybody's like, yeah, everyone's always like, you want Miss Wolf in the middle school? I'm like, great, that's me. <laughs> uh, one thing that's really cool about this uh, her stepping into this position is, is Kira is actually a lot with Katie Bradley and stepping in and her old middle school as the assistant principal now. So that's, that's a pretty cool story. So. Thank you. No. We also have a few more uh, hires for the middle school. First, I want to introduce uh, Margaret Schlitzel. Margaret is the our um, STEM teacher. Sam Bird will be the uh, math interventionist for us. Katie uh, McCartney will, will teach science. And uh, that's all from the middle school. So excited to have these great new hires joining us. And since we stole Miss Wolf, Mrs. Fox had to go find a new second grade teacher. So we. And I hired her today. Her name is Amanda St. John. Okay. And she's coming. Her latest experience was at Cannon Creek. Um, she has lots of teaching experience two master's degrees, so she may cost a lot, but that's okay. <laughs> and then the two out of district students are current Lockwood students that have moved out of district and want to remain here, so it's not adding any students to our class or anything like that. So you did chips? I don't know. <laughs> They've been reviewed by the principals or they in your building, Kelly, the out of district students? So all kids are good kids. Yes, I know we say her first. Fourth and fifth grade, so. Right. so. The ones that are building the house? No. <laughs> okay. It's fine. Oh. Yeah. All right, so do we, uh, are we ready to vote? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And those opposed? All right. Um, Toby, can you remind me? I'm sorry, you guys, this is my first time. You remind me, do you read the titles or do you want me to and then you explain? Either way. Okay. Tim, Tim always wanted to read the titles, but it doesn't matter to me. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll just um, follow Tim soon. Uh, so, or, I'll, yeah, I'll just read the title. So, revisit uh, safe return to schools and continuity of service plans. So right now, this is kind of old hat. This is part of the federal uh, requirements and state requirements for the COVID funding and those type of things. We have to have our safe return to, to, to schools plan on our website. Uh, it has to be on our board agenda to take public input into it on every month. But every three months, we have to go back and revisit it and use it as an action item. Uh, right now, I don't have any recommended changes to where we're at on that plan other than updating it with the dates and those type of things. Um, this is something I want to talk to Mr. Goss about while he's here working with us and see if there's pros and cons, if we have the ability to declare the COVID emergency over and return back to uh, practices as usual. Um, there's not a whole lot that it would impact right now. There's not a whole lot of things we have in place um, opposed to what we're normally doing. I guess the, the streaming of the board meetings and those type of things. Um, but I don't know if there would be fiscal implications on that with the, the COVID funds and those type of things. But uh, we have to have this on our board agenda. We have to have it until 2023. We have to have the plan, but we have to have the 1900 policies. Everything you're doing until 2023. That was tied to this. Yeah. Yeah, this plan has all that, but I don't know that we have to still have the emergency policies. But that's a conversation we can have with Chris. Uh, but. Uh, because of the COVID funding that we have, we have to keep this on our board agenda to September of 2024. So we have two more years of it. So every three months. Okay, so I don't have any recommendations for you at all other than um, 
just updating the dates. I did include the, the final county metrics from the United Health Command. Um, if you remember that set, that group that kind of gives advice to the county health department. We met with them as superintendents. We would meet with them every week for a while when COVID was at the worst, and we got up to every two weeks when we were dealing with Omicron and Delta this year. We got back to one time a week for a while. Um, when we had our last meeting, we didn't even have discussions about meeting next year. I don't think that uh, superintendents were probably going to even bother to meet on it anymore. So, um, any questions? Can we still remain to stream the board meetings? We can do whatever you guys want as well. We just take away that requirement. Okay. I think it's beneficial to still stream it so people can still see it if not able to come. Does anyone want a motion or? I motion to approve. The uh, revised safe return to school and continuity of service plan. Thank you, Josh. I'll second that. Thank you, Patty. So we have a motion from, uh, from Josh and a second from Buddy to um, revisit the safe return to schools and continuity of service plan, services plan, um, primarily including the dates for review. I should have added that. Sorry. Uh, are there any questions before we vote? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? And that is removed. All right, uh, approving student handbooks. We had a couple to look over. Um, Mr. Goya is still looking at the uh, middle school one um, for us to take a peek at afterwards. Um, there were a handful to look at. Do you guys want to go through each handbook, or do you guys want to? Like open it up for just general questions on it and any of them. Yeah, so I can kind of go through it a little bit. Uh, I will tell you that I did have some questions on the activities handbook, and, and Mr. Erickson isn't here today. Um, one of the things that I had asked a question about was the activity fee for high school students and having to have a buy an activity pass. Um, it's very hard. We kind of talked about it earlier when Jamie asked a question about raising funds for the activities. It's Activities are getting more and more expensive. Um, I mean, obviously, we've seen, we all know what's happening with hotel rooms. You know, so if, if we have a basketball team go to state, I know the state lacrosse was supposed to be in Bozeman last a few weeks ago, and they actually moved it to Helena because of the cost of hotel rooms. Uh, uh, state volleyball this year was in Bozeman the same time as a, a uh, modified playoff game, so rooms were extremely expensive for that. Um, you know, our, our uh, Soccer teams go to the Flathead every year to play, um, so they're staying up there in those hotels, and then you're paying the, the busing fees. Um, gate uh, for high school events usually breaks even. What we take in and uh, uh, people paying to come to the games usually basically pays for the referees, the officials. Uh, middle school events are it's a loss leader. We don't we don't the the, the small amount that we charge for. Uh, Admittance doesn't cover the cost of the, the refs even, so you know we have to we have to kind of supplement that. Um, we have a lot of kids coming to the events. You know, if, if they have if 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 there's a volleyball match going on, the boys football team has practice. The practicality of chasing all the football players out and making them come back in to pay or show their their, their passes. So what we're looking at is anybody that. Is a part of the sport also has to buy the activity card. It's pretty common practice for, for almost all schools. Um, I did talk with Mike. You know, one of the things we wanted to, we wanted when we started the high school here is we didn't want fiscal uh, concerns to ever eliminate any kids from participating. So what we talked about is we will have a scholarship program for kids that or families that might not be able to afford that or, or struggle with that. Uh, we have the Don Reed Fund um, that we can pay for those uh, out of, and then Mike will work with their coaches. So let's say Rob has a couple football players that maybe are struggling financially. We will scholarship them their, their activity pass. 
but then we'll also talk to them about maybe running the change of a couple of junior high games. So they so they earn that back. Uh, we're not they're not just getting charity on that, but we don't want it to we don't want it to be a barrier for any kids to participate. So Mike and I kind of talked all that through that whole process, and I feel comfortable with it. Um, again, just like we talked about. Um, with the transportation for next year, we just don't know what it's going to cost to get teams to places. And um, you know, our our budgeted activities are pretty much on par with most schools our size, uh, based on the class A information I've been able to gather. But uh, we know that those costs are going to skyrocket. So, can you update his handbook then on that? Yeah, yeah, it's in here. Uh, and then I love the idea. Uh, as you pull that up, just of the trade-off, I know we heard quite a few people talk about, we'd love to take my whole family, and by the time I add up all my kids, who are in second through fifth grade, you know, it costs a certain dollar, so to be able to have that trade-off and know that um, the students who are through K through eight, don't, they just present the ID cards to get in, and they don't have to get an app. Yeah, we won't charge the K-8 students. You know, part of that's just to kind of build that school spirit and get those kids excited about wanting to be on those teams and stuff. So yeah, that was part of the trade-off with that as well too. Okay. We might charge we might charge a dollar for every time a kid runs a lap around the gym. Though. We can make some money on that. I had a question about the activities handbook. It says no eighth grader can play in consecutive ses seasons in one sport. Does that mean? So that means they can't play eighth grade girls basketball and they go play high school girls basketball. They have to, it has to be either or. Um, so, they, um, so they couldn't play their normal season as eighth grade and they come up. I, I believe that's the idea behind that. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So in yeah. some years, eighth grade girls basketball season's kind of in the fall, early winter, but like before uh -huh. high school starts. So they can't roll the season over. So they have to have like tryouts beforehand and declare that eighth grader. So, okay. so how do you do tryouts for an eighth grader before all of the other high school kids? Yeah, well, so how is that going to work? So if they try out for, say, softball, because softball that for eighth grade is earlier than softball for high school. So if they wait to go play high school and they get cut, then they miss their chances of, of playing softball as an eighth grader. Well, they wouldn't be consecutive seasons because they would be spaced yeah. in between. Yeah. They could play eighth grade girls. Like eighth grade softball in the fall, and then still trying to play. Oh, and cool. Yeah, it's one of those sports that go back to back, yeah. which is right there. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Good. I think that might be an MHS I believe so. And it's kind of like all. I don't think it is because my niece played middle school basketball and then played high school basketball as soon as her season was over. Uh, or maybe uh, rule violator. <laughs> <laughs> I have a new eighth grade to play high school unless you're. It's brand new this year. MHS, they just yeah. made that. Some of the issues, and Mike's not here, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but some of it would also be taking playing time from other kids. I mean, it's a high school student taking, basically, as a high school athlete, and who's an eighth grade or playing high school sports, taking playing, taking, taking playing time from middle school athletes. So uh, that could be part of it, too. Yeah, so if you if you read that last sentence there, once the athlete decides to participate in a sport level or activity in a season in seasons that overlap, they will not be eligible to participate in the higher or lower level sport in that same season. So on the softball example, those don't overlap. So you can play eighth grade softball and if you're good enough you can make the high school softball team. But so if if you tried out and declared that you wanted to run high school track, that would mean that you would only run high school track, you don't get to go down and run junior high track in addition to that. Does that make sense? Or if you're going to play um, boys basketball run the same time, wrestling runs the same time. So if you're a wrestler and you make a uh, high school team, you would only wrestle on the high school team, you don't get a drop down and wrestle in middle school as well. Is the way that I understand that. And I can clarify that with Mike if, if that's wrong, and we can bring this back next month for further clarification. But the way that I read this is that only affects when the seasons overlap and they're at the same time. And that's an MHSA rule, not a Lockwood rule, correct? No, that's I believe it's a MHSA rule. I don't believe it's an MHSA rule. MHSA did not um, 
they, they, they're allowing eighth graders to play, but it's the individual school district's choices. I know there's other schools around us that are saying if there's a need, uh, if, if there's not enough um, students in our high school program that they're allowing eighth graders to go up if there's a need. Um, but I don't know any other schools that are the same that all eighth graders can come up and, and play in high school. What's the rule if there's overlapping, like let's say soccer and football overlap in the, at the high school level? Can a student play both sports? It's very difficult to be to play sports in this. that are all the, the, the one the one time it really works is if you're a kicker and a soccer player. That's about the only time that I've really seen in high school where they can they can do both. Yeah. Um, although it's pretty tough to be like a cross country runner and a soccer player or football and soccer. It's it's very tough to do. We don't have some rules up let's say that they can't do it. Okay, that would be, I was curious. That would have to be a decision between the athlete, the parents, and the coaches. Oh, okay. So it's, there's no... Because, again, this one's a little confusing to me about the consecutive seasons. Um, I read it. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I read it as no eighth grader can play in the second season. It looks more like you get held back in eighth grade. You can't play it football again or something. That's how I understood it. Yeah, maybe we could just get clarification. Do we want to table the activities? If we could. Can I ask a separate question before you move on? And maybe Mike's probably the best one to answer, but since he's not here, I'll ask the board. It seems like uh, I recall that there was no 6th uh, and 7th grade track, and it starts in 8th grade, right? And It um, starts in 7th. It does start in 7th, but no 6th. So they were middle school, but, but couldn't compete. So is I guess my question is, is there... Not that I have a sixth grader coming up, but I think that that's something that should be thought about to open up to all middle schoolers. I think and we did this year. We, we did so this year. It's alleviated. So I guess the second part of my question um, is, would the track be uh, opened up to the community to be able to you know, run laps? I know some schools allow it, some don't. Um, but it would be nice. And I remember when you know, we were debating on opening the high school and the merits of it. And one of the big selling points to the community, I think, was that there's going to be a lot of community activity. This is going to be open up for the community. And the stadium was never talked about being No, we didn't talk. I'm, I'm talking about the school, yes. right? And and so to me, the, the, the stadium and the, the track are a big part of that because there was a lot of selling of it. So, so I just hope like the stadium wouldn't be open. That's why we put the walking track around the campus. Yeah. Uh, if, if somebody reaches out, if there's interest, if there's truly interest, if you reach out to Community Ed, we can get something set up where we can have somebody there to open it in the evenings for a couple hours, a couple times a week. Right now, nobody's ever come to us and said we would like to have it open. All right, fair enough. If you really want to do it, Tuesdays and Thursdays, we do open field for football from 6 to 8. We can go to the main track there. Yeah, I mean, I yeah, think I though, but like. <laughs> I, I personally don't like running in circles um, <laughs> as much. I like watching cars go in circles. But, uh, but I have had this conversation with, with several community people who have asked about that, um, yeah. that they'd like somewhere that they could go walk their laps or run their laps to get their exercise. The past couple weeks I've had random people that just come walk as long as they need. By the time I leave them. Okay, cool. Well, the big thing with that is you can't have you can't have parents pushing carts, like strollers, because that the rubber wheels, that wears down the track, actually, believe it or not. So I know that we were kicking kids off the track before we had a fence in there. We, we'd see strollers or bikes and stuff like that. Skateboards. Those tires, you know, skateboards. And so it has to truly be dirt bikes. Are okay, though? No dirt bikes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I got to jump for those of them. That's one of the things. So that's, so that's, there would have to be some stipulations in there. I know how people like to walk in and push their baby strollers and stuff like that. Or pull it away, and that's something that couldn't be on our items because that, that makes sense because, because of that. Sir, or if somebody has a dog, they don't pick up after it. And our plan, our plan is that's just you. Our plan is also to open the walking track around the gym in the mornings yeah. for, for community members that want to come in as well, too, next year. Just because of the COVID, we haven't been able to do that the last couple of years. Fair enough. Thank you. So, I have one more question on the activities. Uh, it says. That we have to have a copy of the sports physical concussion form, medical consent, and then handbook sign off, and all fees are paid. 
Um, do students have to be covered medically in order to participate in a sport? Like, do they have to have medical insurance to be eligible? That's a good question. I don't believe so. I don't believe that's a family. Okay. I just asked because I have a friend that at Huntley, her son got told he couldn't play golf because he was not covered medically by any insurance. He wasn't on Healthy Kids and he wasn't on her medical plan. And so I just wanted to know if we have that and what we do in that scenario. I think if we don't, we should probably, you know, call that out in a handbook of what that expectation is. And that can be a question that can ask me a question for Mike again as well too. Okay. I don't think we ask for their other than on the physical. I think it might have who their primary medical person is and what their coverage is. But. I think it's for the primary provider, but not ask for insurance. I feel like there is a, on the, uh, I think you feel, I feel like there's an insurance upload thing or something, but maybe it is just. You're, you're right. I'm going to apply it. I'm going to apply it. I'm going to apply it. I just know I never get 100%. I'm never 100% green, and I never know what it is that I'm missing. Yeah, it might be on there. I think there is something on there. I can find out if I say that. You only have one kid. Yeah. <laughs> and it's probably not a very common scenario. I think it's just something that I wanted to bring up and understand because we do live in a community that might not have full coverage of their children. And there's programs that we can, as a school district, provide where people can buy the health insurance for the season through that. Okay. Um, we've never done it here, but I've done it at other school districts. That was kind of before the, you know, before we had the universal health care and these type of things. But, uh, I'm sure those are still around too. Right. So that'd be a good question for Mike too. So sounds good. So, um, does anyone want to move to approve the student handbooks minus the activities handbook? The uh, handbooks listed, I do guess. Do you want the principals to go through any of the changes or anything? I had some questions on the other one. Sorry. Yes, okay. So there. maybe we'll just go through elementary. Ms. Fox, Mr. Kinsey, do you guys want to highlight any changes? Calendar. Calendar. That's it. Um, and then we changed some of the language in the lunch. Lunch is the cafeteria just to be determined. Nothing tour shattering. So that's what I was curious about on that meal stuff. First of all, can you add an E in my name, please? <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Um, and then, so school schedule calendar, it's 8, not 8.15 next year. 8. Okay, perfect. Um, and then the meal policy, I know we talked about if Senator Baines, if it gets extended the waiver, will our handbook change? Yeah, so that's what so I asked. I told all the principals to go ahead and just put to be determined in there on that. So um, the feedback we got from Sodexo is we would go back to the 2019 price because we don't want people to have to all of a sudden pay and then have a big up in the cost of the prices. So we're going to wait. We don't want it to be confusing. So what we want to do is we want to approve that as to be determined. If there is an extension of the to the summer months before we print these up. So the nice thing about now is we can run these electronically. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to get them sent off to a printer like we used to have to do with them. And so what we'll do is if, if, if the waiver is extended, we'll put that clarifying language in there that, that there are no costs for the meals. If it does not get extended, then we'll put in the prices from training. And that's all, all three of them should be. Or two, I guess, will put Exactly. It does. So I think right now in the K-5 handbook, it's just generic, right? There's no prices listed that I saw. It just says to be determined. Okay. That's what I thought. So then we won't have to change it. If it, regardless of what it is, it doesn't oh. matter because it'll be determined at that point. I get it. But if, we'll send out notices though, this year. Yeah. At the beginning of the year, we'll put that price on it, whatever that is. Yeah, right. If there is. Yeah. And if we know that we're going to have a we'll put the prices in. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Surprising. I like handbooks, so I would buy them, but if you don't get much questions, I'm good. 
No, we, we will add that language to it for them. If we do have to pay for them, we will add those prices to this handbook. I did see on that that um, you guys are still uh, limiting visitors on campus. Is that what? What's the criteria for them to be turned away? I guess as as a parent, like if they wanted to come and have lunch or do whatever. I mean, is it just at your discretion, or because it doesn't say anything? I'd like to have as many people possible in there, um, Jamie. But I do know sometimes, say for instance, after a school shooting, random times, I don't I don't want people in there. Okay. Uh, and um, you know, I think. I think it's probably best for me to decide that. To decide that at those times. I mean, I've had off and on people. We took a lot of it off. Had people at lunches and things like that. Then for a while, though, I was turning people away, just saying, "Sorry, I don't like very much more traffic." Because of fine balance. I mean, one day people are wanting more safety and not people in there, and the next day they want everybody to have access to it. So I think it's. I don't think it should be a set thing. Sometimes we have parents also who are distractions in the cafeteria, and we need to have that permission to say no. You know, we don't want you to join us anymore. Sorry. So. I just think that, you know, that parents should be able to come and, and be able to have lunch with their kids. Um, and the fact that there's no uh, detail on reasonings why or that it's in black and white, it's just, it's just hard, I guess, as a parent um, um, to see that that is not in a black and white situation. I guess so that they can rely on versus just being I mean, I can see if there's a shooting, just rep, you know, that in, in the nation that is heightened the security of the school. I get that, but just for a parent to show up and say, that, or ask if they can have lunch, and they get turned away for no reason, I don't think that's okay either. Doesn't I don't know. I think most of the time I would let people in, but I I would like to keep it at at my discretion or random. Really, it's up to you guys if you want to discuss that. But like I said, on yeah. Monday, everybody wants safety and everybody right. wants... Yeah, yeah so how long, long to be after a, an incident are we going to heighten our security? And at what point do we relax it again? Mm -hmm. Well, never. Also, I agree. I think if we keep never it relax. always the same... Mm -hmm. And the reality is, is... How many people get shot in Texas or Florida or any other state has absolutely no bearing on who's going to get shot here in this community. Right. But what does is the parents in this community, or the kids of some of the parents in this community. So we have to be able to regulate these people at our discretion, because when they do get shot here, it's nobody else's responsibility but ours. And they're going to say, why did you let that person in the room or in the building? And it's because, you know, well, that's what we trust. Our administration, they get to know parents. But they know them. We, we've also had to deal with situations where there's, you know, uh, incident in the neighborhood or something like that, and there might be restraining orders, or, or families don't want their children around the parents from other families and those type of things. And so we have to kind of manage all those different scenarios as well too. We've had parents videoing in our cafeterias. Other kids, they don't have permission to video. I mean. Food allergies it's more, where they bring pizza it's more in. problems than I think you guys realize. You know, it's problems. And am I right to assume that you guys are like explaining to the parents, you know, like it's a busier day or naturally mm -hmm. this is a time where our staff is low and just trying yeah. to help yeah. manage and help you enjoy your time with your kiddo just yeah. doesn't well, seem like. Well, what they may do is, I, I know they've done this in the past too, like they may meet, a lot of parents come in and have lunch with their child, but they have lunch with their child in the family resource mm -hmm. center rather than at the table where there's 30 others. 30 other kids, yeah. There's really no room. I don't think I've ever been turned away in the middle of school when I went to eat with Logan, ever. 
place to switch when you have something third. So, in so, 17 years of being here, the hardest thing to manage is in the cafeteria, no matter what building you're in. <laughs> when you have 300 kids eating lunch and you have that one parent come in that brings pizza and they're three little kids and they're running around unsupervised, that alone, that one time, makes you not want to do that again. So, it, it is hard to just say it's open it up. Because we have parents that just don't know. It's not like they're coming in to be rude, but it really is hard when you already have two or three hundred kids eating and three parents monitoring that with you. It's hard for that to have that distraction or a parent that gives a kid with an allergy something they're not supposed to eat because they don't know. I think, uh, you know, I'm thinking people call and set that up with me and, and stuff. I think that's fine. So, but again, I mean, we, we have to wait. You have to wait as a community, as, as a school. Is safety important to you? Or is visiting the school important to you? I, I think those are head to head right now. So I don't think I've ever had an issue with you, with your discretion of how no. our, I remember three years ago the school went to lockdown because somebody was roofing across the street. And you guys are the ones that had to deal with that, not us. I mean, you guys deal with the, the kids every day, not us. So, I mean, and there's ways to work around it, too. I mean, yeah. if, if you call and give me some notice and just say, why don't you meet them in the office, I'll just give you the call. Okay. Yeah. There is that, too, but it, it does open doors a little bit for more access. And to speak to handbooks more generically, I will say just um, as a person who has to, like, put together handbooks, um, less is more often because the more rigid, and I, I'm sure um, when we talk about policies and stuff, we'll go over this too with MTSBA, but you know, the more rigid we get, the more we our hands are kind of cupped, and so when we have that black and white, we have to let angry Johnny, Johnny Angry Dad walk in uh, because it says he can walk in even though we know he's disgruntled. He might not have a restraining order on him, he might not have these things happening, but you know, to be able to have that discretion, uh, making it that black and white. Um, as a former rule breaker myself, if it's black and white, I can tell you how to break around, work around it. And so it's um, easier to not have that, so there, there is a little bit more discretion at the administrative, administrative level. Um, and then on the other side, it is difficult to say, when can I, when can I not? You know, so I think more of encouraging people to work in my world directly with their manager on things, and in this world directly with the, um, school administrator, the building administrators would be more advantageous for us as a district than... I think the only thing that, I agree Sylvia, and I think the only thing to try to maybe educate, and maybe it doesn't belong in the handbook, but um, educate the parents on, on differences, right? The different buildings, because I think that there's still some impressions that well, Mr. Goy let me have lunch. Why is Miss Fox? And so just being um, aware of that. And, and she's and nice. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking we can't put that in there. No, but I mean, the reason. I, I think, again, the handbook seems legit and good. And it's just more from a board perspective, we should, you know, and, and I think you guys do do that. Um, and so just keep doing that. And I think the the handbook says it good you know it's up to your discretion and if you want to tell Joe's parents that he's terrible go for me <laughs> but well no what happens in the morning is not reflecting but what the situation is at by lunch right that there's no it, this should be administration discretion I was I was a little upset when I found out we needed 24 hours notice for the middle school but again it's his discretion. He wants to know what's going on. I was upset because I, if I have some client cancel and I can pop in for 20 minutes or something for lunchtime, you know. But then again, that was fine in your building. In his building is different, and I realize that. So you have to get better. And I don't, I don't think we need to change the handbook when it comes to admitting visitors. And Josh, I think that you, you hit it right on the head that. You know, people are frustrated that we want to know in advance that um, and approve uh, 
because I, I do need to look and make sure that my staffing is okay that day. I need to make sure that all of the other scenarios that we have going on are good in advance, where if a parent wants to stop in and take their kid to lunch, go ahead, go ahead. take them out, absolutely. Take them on your 20-minute lunch, you know, to go have lunch, that's completely fine. But when there's the other scenarios, it's, it makes it harder to be 30 parents decide I want to drop in at lunchtime. Yep. Well, in middle school, there's not an option. So in elementary, like Kelly said, they could have lunch in the conference room or they could have lunch in the, the family resource center. But in the middle school, there's not a lot of options where you can go and just have lunch with your child. It's in the lunchroom. Yeah. And I'm sure if I said, hey, I want to come in tomorrow, you're not just going to be, nope. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do this. Like, oh, you should have called me five hours ago. So you're not, <laughs> no, you're going to have to raise me or yes, to be yes or no. So, yes. no, I don't, I don't feel the board should be yeah. hamstringing the administration. Those type of so are we good to move on to the elementary handbook? And yes. Gordon, do you have anything that you want to highlight in the high school handbook? Um, uh, just a couple little things, just kind of some clarifications. One thing we're going to add in, in our loss of credit policy, we had in our admin meeting today, we talked about people bringing in doctor's notes. Uh, we don't want to hold on to those because that could be a further violation every time someone goes to a doctor. And so we're going to ask parents to keep track of those. And then if an issue does come up, where they go over their, their days and look at a possible loss of credit, um, then we'll ask them to bring those notes into us. It's going to be a, a repository, so to speak, of, of, of doctor's notes because other, if someone else that have looked at that, that drawer or file that has all these doctor's notes and they say, well, why is Johnny going to this therapist or why is Johnny having new or, you know, stuff like that. So we want people coming across and things like that. So that should be uh, something that we've got uh, in there as well. Um, one thing that I, I, did, I do need to do is update our electives. Some, some name changes have happened and stuff like that, so I'm just going to, I do need to update the, the name of some of our elective they change names to meet some CTE requirements with the state and stuff like that as well. Uh, but really it's kind of just some little tweaks here and there. Um, one thing, if you want to leave right where you were just at, Tilden, we are adding in this one uh, section about unlawful recording. Uh, it is against the law in the state of Montana just to start recording people. And we've had some students that are trying to do that and maybe in like gotcha moments with other kids or staff, or the case may be. Uh, and so we are putting in a unlawful uh, recording uh, rule that's in there. Uh, the, there's guidelines as to uh, when you can record a teacher and when you can't. Um, and things like that, and they need to make sure to follow the state law uh, with that particular ruling. I don't, in some states, you can record no matter what. Uh, Montana is not that particular state. You have to have, uh, you have to, you don't have to have permission, but you have to give knowledge that you are recording in conversations and stuff like that. Mr. Kirsten, I know that um, that'll be in the student, like the student handbook too. Um, in high school, do we have them sign it at the beginning of the year? Um, well, yeah, we'll, we'll have a few like, uh, we'll have a few like, we'll have a few like, we'll have And then do we, um, talk about that, like, at, uh, do, do you have any yeah, yeah, no, I do okay. class meetings. Okay. Uh, okay. I have a question. Yep. Student found guilty of harassment or bullying. Uh, first offense, second offense, third offense, fourth offense? What page are you on there? Uh, 25 at the bottom. Why? I, I don't understand why we're giving so many opportunities to victimize somebody if they've been found guilty of harassment or bullying. Um, I think it is. Yeah, I think the reason behind there was there are seven. <laughs> Very things of what can be considered harassment and what can be considered, well, it's a wide open thing. So it could be such a, a, a wide open thing. There, I have a caveat there that says I can jump to anything that I want to. Um, if, I, if I feel like first offense, you need to be taken to an expulsion hearing, I'll take you to an expulsion hearing. Um, I have some discretion involved, I have some discretion uh, in handbook as well to jump to any stage. Um, that, that was, I think that's on the very last page. Yeah, someone just pointed that out. I didn't know. We, that. Have, the, we have the discretion. So sometimes it, it's kind of the, the level of the harassment and bullying that happens to be in that particular. So I just want to make sure. Okay. 
and, and you don't have four strikes in the no, no, no. And typically, principals always have the discretion if, if it's a gross situation, if it's you know gross disrespect, if, if it they can go from the OSS. Yeah, you can you can jump straight if yeah. you, you, you may get the harassment is to such a level where there's name calling and profanities and those type of things that are so offensive. It can be they can they have the discretion to jump to a suspension okay. right away. Okay. That makes more sense now. Thank you. That's all I have. No, no, thank you. One other thing I guess I will point out, and there's, I did make a change in the dress codes. I took one little, um, we took one little thing out. What page are you on there? I got to find that. 30. 30. 30. I think it regards, in regards to clothing being a distraction um, and disruptions. I don't. Uh, I had some young ladies that came and actually talked to me about this, um, and, and it's not so much that their clothes are a disruption, but and not just young ladies, but anyone in general. But it's not professional dress, and so that's how. Uh, so I just took that that sentence out of there, um, just so they should be appropriately covered. Period. We're not going to say that they're a disruption or or otherwise. Um, then we'll fall upon the professional dress that's in there as well. Is that no crop tops? Is that what I saw next? It's a, no, it, that includes uncovered midsection? Midsection, yes. I know, so that's popularly yes, now. Yes, it is. So yes. ladies and gentlemen, it's coming back yes, for the guys. Yes, yes, yes. I've actually had tons of boys in front of us. That's terrible. Put up the best crop tops. There may have been a picture that you guys are kind of doing with me wearing my dollar. Mesh, mesh, mesh. Yeah. 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 And that's oftentimes a conversation, like, where, can you tell me where you are allowed to go to work and where that outfit? Right. And um, it's pretty hard for them to come up with that. That's, yeah, I'll leave that. Yep. The professional dress, is that really the other way to the, I, I've seen students on campus wearing dog collars and things like that. So I've asked some kids if they like this little spike. We will ask them to take some things off if they're like the spiky. I think it, 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 the other thing there about spikes and chains and stuff like Anything that. Anything that we use as weapons. We ask kids to remove them. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions for Mr. Plasma? I can't wear throwing stars. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> so I just have a quick question. Um, or I think, and I went past it, but about um, promoting fighting yep. and that. So just any of these in general, if a student comes to you and says somebody was promoting fighting, then that, that like starts an investigation, doesn't it? I mean, how do these so, so the promoting fighting, that's more like you're the one, you're recording it, and then you're posting that off to social media, oh, okay. that's where you're promoting that fight. And, and so and so we've given kids consequences because they're they're not trying to stop things, in, but they're actually promoting kids fighting by trying to go viral. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which can also lead to subsequent fights. Yeah. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah. No, 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 yeah, so yeah, we, uh, that, that's more of that, that is there. If someone comes and says, hey, I hear that so-and-so is gonna, you know, they're gonna meet at lunch or somewhere they're gonna fight, Mr. Dean and I will grab those kids right away before the kids there and we'll have a conversation about what they should and shouldn't be doing. Right. Okay. And usually the person holding the phone is one yelling, world star. So. World star? That's all right. Any other questions for Mr. Klasner? Now we'll move on to Mrs. Poole. This is what she's prepared for. This is what I'm prepared for. <laughs> Do you have any questions first? Okay, so mainly I added a cover sheet and did a few just uh, name changes, things like that, page numbers to make it more uh, easily read. Um, one big thing that I feel strongly about is that the Royal Academy is not a standalone. Um, they are part of, we are part of the Lockwood High School, so that's why that's noted that way on the front cover. Um, and then uh, we'll notice on page one, added, um, we redid that statement of purpose. So if you learn anything about me tonight, there is no such thing as me with a statement. 
I never make a statement, I make several. <laughs> so it's a paragraph, sorry about that. Um, but I just, again, wanted to pull in um, that we will have uh, our diploma mean something based in the rigorous coursework. Um, where we have systems in place for the collaboration and the mentoring that are uh, part of our program, so I want to make sure that those were highlighted. The rest you'll see um, is the main changes, and then toward the end, the only thing that I changed there was just some ordering. So it wasn't the content that was uh, changed uh, much beyond some wordsmithing, uh, but it was just the order of so that attendance came first, um, followed by um, uh, the restorative practices and attendance. So just reordered a few things. Any questions? I do like the addition that you had to the program review process too and having the kids yes, the students yes. be part of that partnership. Any questions for Gwen? Well, we're off early. That's easy. This is the first time doing this. So Thank you. Since you would admit you didn't let me off easy the first time. Okay. <laughs> Does anyone want to make a motion sans the activities handbook? Yeah, what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to hold off on the activities, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I'll make a motion to accept the elementary, the high school, and the rural academy handbook. Second. A motion from Scott and a second from Josh to approve the elementary, high school, and rural academy handbooks. Questions? With changes. Just the elementary with my name. With a change. change. Sure. Aye. 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 So just updated language and fees and all those type of things. Uh, just it's a year-to-year -year agreement with the sheriff's office to have the school resource officer. So I just need to approve that, and I'll get it uh, sent off to the, the sheriff's office as soon as you guys approve it. I'll make a motion that we approve the memorandum for the resource officer. I'll second that. A uh, motion from Scott and a second from Buddy. Any questions? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Sorry. All right, that motion passes. Uh, uh, approved resolution to dispose of property. So you know, obviously we're purchasing anything we purchase with the school is purchased with taxpayer monies. So there's some rules that go along with that as far as disposing of those items as well too. Uh, we typically run a resolution once at the start of the fiscal year and allow Mark, we put the dates where people can come see what we have and that allows Mark to uh, dispose of things quarterly so they're not storing it for an entire year. Um, and so we'll just have some updated dates on those type of things. We try to work around what dates would work well for Mark's guys to be there in case people do show up. Um, there's very rarely anything with much value. Uh, we, we milk the life out of everything we pretty much can. A lot of times there are weeded library books, maybe some broken furniture, or some, you know, <laughs> Mac 2Es that have, a, have to have their hard drives pulled out of them. So, um, we just ask you to prove that this once a year, and then we advertise it in the Elston County News, and then Mark's guys will go ahead and dispose of those things two or three or four times a year. So I make a motion to approve the resolution to dispose of the properties. And let me you know if there's any lawnmowers or side by sides going. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that. Lawnmowers and side by sides. Yeah. Okay. Second okay. the motion. <laughs> We got a motion from Scott and a second from Buddy to approve the resolution to dispose of the property. Um, are there any questions? Is there anything we change in the last name? Uh, anything recyclable we can get? Like those the boilers when they come out? Is there a core on them? Or? Yeah, we usually take the uh, heat exchanger in or 
items. So. And that just goes in the maintenance budget then? Uh, that just goes back in the general fund. The general fund? See that. All right. Um, all those approved? Aye. 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 All those opposed? And that motion passes. Uh, approved resolution to transfer funds. So these are resolutions we again do every year. Um, there's some flexibility allotted in the Montana law to transfer these funds. So at the end of the fiscal year, if we have monies left over in some of these funds, we, we have to forfeit them. And so the idea is these resolutions give us more flexibility. I was sharing with Jamie before the board meeting. Uh, sometimes we have disputed taxes and those type of things and we get an influx of money in June that we aren't really expecting. And so this type of a flexibility allows us to carry that money, those monies over. Uh, with the transportation, we will max out, especially right now with the cost of fuel and the cost of drivers, we will max out our reserves in, in, uh, in uh, our budgeting process for next year. Uh, right now, our transportation fund runs about a million dollars, so that's capped at 20%, so roughly $200,000. We will back for that full two hundred thousand dollars before we transfer anything over into the flex fund. The nice thing about the flex fund is it's a fund that we don't have to use by the end of the year. That money can be carried over as long as we need to. There's no limit on it, so it's kind of just our kind of our rainy day fund is what we've always referred to it a little bit. And we've had to dip into that a little bit over the years, but uh, um, so that's the first resolution we'll be able to do that. Uh, Lori's not anticipating much money, maybe 25 grand maximum, and that's if things work out really well for us. But rather than forfeit that money and then have to, you know, uh, go back to our taxpayers for, for that extra mill, of, that would be $25,000, we'd rather just carry that money over. And then, um, obviously, school safety's on everybody's minds right now. This was done probably three sessions ago that, uh, there are several different budgets that we can transfer into the year funds over that can go into building reserve and be used towards safety. So that can go towards TANA salary, that can go towards things like the, the metal detector we purchased this year, any of those safety issues, the reflex, uh, reflex protect stuff that we have, the kind of like a maze type thing that we have in our classrooms. So again, not anticipating very much, but whatever flexibility we can have, we want to keep. Make a motion that we approve the transfer of funds as presented there. As needed. I second it. We got a motion from Scott and a second from Buddy to approve the resolution to transfer of funds as presented. Does anyone have any questions? Or comments? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And all those opposed? So that motion is passed to approve the resolution to transfer funds. We make more motions tonight than we did in the eight years old. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, approve property and liability insurance renewal, MSGIA. So our property and liability service uh, insurance is through MSGIA. Um, they've been great to work with. Um, a couple years ago, and you'll see it reflected in here, we had the big um, the big claim where we had the roofer that didn't uh, cover the, the window, uh, the area that was tore off. Um, it was actually a, a vertical surface, but we had a horrible uh, rainstorm just prior to the 4th of July, and we had standing water in classrooms. Kira was, in, was one of those teachers in that area. Um, it was 4th of July weekend. I was able to get a hold of them. They had an a, a estimator on, on campus that following work day. Um, they've been great to work with. Uh, a lot of our, our, uh, safe, our uh, um, there's a new name for it now. Vector Technologies, is that what it is now? The, the training videos that we utilize for a lot of our staff, for our paraprofessionals, our maintenance folks. They provide a lot of those things. They actually give us great support. I will tell you that the increase has been significant. The last two years, we've had over a 20% increase. Um, I did reach out to Sean on that. Um, uh, 
obviously last year we added a whole lot of square footage to our coverage. Um, the drivers this year are threefold. One is we're adding an additional class next year. So like we just talked about earlier in the meeting, we have 200 additional students right now. We'll probably have another 150 next year. Um, so that drives our overall enrollment, drives some of those costs. Um, Cybersecurity is a huge issue right now. Uh, Darby and I, and, and we've been having lots of conversations about these. We've, we've done a lot of things with our teachers uh, trying to implement uh, two-factor authentication, those type of things, uh, because of people hacking school systems. Obviously, we're all kind of aware of what happened with Columbia Falls a few years ago. Um, and then the third one is just based on the, the interests that we're all dealing with right now, the cost for replacement per square footage has gone up significantly over the last year as well too. I think it was around $20 per square foot um, because they have to insure us at the replacement cost. So if we had a situation like how we had, you know, 10 years ago or so, and a building burnt down, they have to be able to insure it for the cost of replacing that. So um, I did ask, and we are going to meet with their, their uh, leadership to just kind of go over some things that they're doing to try and control costs. Um, you know, if, if we're looking at a 20% increase again next year, I think we need to go out for bid. Um, typically with insurance, it's really not great to go out for bid every year. What happens a lot of times is people do what they call buy your business. So they give you a great rate the first year, and then you'll see disproportionate increases the, the next couple of years. But just to do due diligence, we certainly want to want to take a look at that if we continue to see these type of increases. Um, and, I'll do whatever you guys want if you want us to go out and get bids right away at the start of next year. I know that's a little bit tougher because they don't have that year's worth of experience. Um, but uh, I would tell you MSGIA is a good partner for us. And uh, I think we're looking at a little bit larger. I think everybody's looking at increases right now across the board, but we're looking at a little bit larger increase because we are adding that additional So, uh, maintenance department has several vehicles, uh, trucks to push snow, those type of things, and then we have two school vehicles. We have a van and a SUV. For so that covers the person that's operating it too? Yeah, so I won't name any names, but one of our principals slid into the other car yeah. about a year ago. So that, that covers our position and we have the other So we don't have a separate policy. No, we don't have a separate, they cover everything. So. And there's guidelines that go along with that that we have to have the person driving its driver's license on file and all those type of things and stuff. So we purchased those a lot probably like four or five years ago, I think. Um, instead of paying my wage, so I just know to drive to Missoula. We have principals driving in Missoula instead of reimbursing them at 52, 53 cents a mile. We just have to get the school vehicle and put mm -hmm. gas in it. It's actually coming very handy for transporting students as well, too, for, for different events. Uh, FFA, uh, Honor Choir, those type of things, a lot of times we can just use the vans and the SUVs to get folks there. Board uses them. Um... Yeah, so like when you guys go to Missoula next year, if you go to MSL in Missoula, we'll have one of the principals drive. And, not Mr. G. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope. I don't know if the other one driving either. <laughs> I may have hit a bird on our very first trip and all oh, driving show I move that we approve the invoice for an MSGIA for our property and liability. I have a second. Second. Uh, I have a motion from Josh and a second from Scott to approve the property and liability insurance for the MSGIA. Any other questions? Lacey, you have one for me. No. All right. All those approved? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 
All right. Um, Move we adjourn. <laughs> that, one, <laughs> that one's approved and moves. Uh, and then motion to adjourn. Any seconds? Second. Josh is the second, so this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, guys. On page 15 of that is some of that cyber mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.